uh, only two weeks ago, uh, we had Eric Kandel here for the first lecture, uh, the Weizsäcker lecture, the first lecture of uh, the semester. And then last week, uh, all the fellows uh, uh, in wonderful presentations put us to coin a word in the mood for more. And uh, Mary, uh, always courageous, decided that she would be willing to be the first to go. And so she will. But I'm not here to introduce Mary. Uh, quite to the contrary, uh, that will be done uh, by Lance Olson. And uh, about Olson, I have to say that he, in, 19, in uh, tw uh, 2013, in the spring of 2013, was the Mary Ellen von der Heiden fiction fellow at the American Academy. So his credentials are pretty good, uh, uh, clearly, because he was selected for this. But uh, as I said uh, to uh, 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 Lance and Andy, his wife, who is also here, uh, uh, they were here just in 2013, and they have managed to be back here for an entire full year as a German exchange service uh, artists in residence. And I said, they remind me of Stanford students, undergraduates, Stanford undergraduates. Uh, uh, they graduate after four years, and then they have only one goal in life, to stay at Stanford as co-terms for a master's degree or whatever. Now, uh, the Olsons were not quite that good. They didn't manage to stay right away, but within a year they have come back. And, uh, uh, and that is wonderful, and Lance will introduce uh, uh, Mary. Uh, Lance is a professor of, creative, of literature and creative writing at the University of Utah. Uh, now, why the reason he is so eminently qualified to introduce Mary is that he actually wrote a whole book about the first Berlin, the Berlin year. I'm sure there will be another one. And you understand, so I, I read this, and uh, uh, then I came across a passage that made it clear to me why Lance is the one who has to introduce Mary. And I will read that passage to you, and then I will sit down. At the academy, they are paying me to write. It's extraordinary. They cook for me five days a week, clean the apartment, and change towels every Monday, offer Andy and me private tours of galleries, free tickets for films and music, a chance to meet German artists and writers and musicians, and they provide me with a generous monthly stipend. Now, anybody who is willing to say that in public <laughs> and in writing is the one who has to introduce Mary. <laughs> so once upon a time, goes the story Mary Capello tells in her 2011 meditation on the idea of ingestion, there lived a man called the human ostrich. The human ostrich was a performer who swallowed things for a living. Whatever, in fact, members of his audience would offer up to him on stage. Unfortunately, one night he accidentally swallowed the four-foot-long window chain he'd been inserting down his throat and pulling out again. When one Dr. Hopkins operated on him a few hours later, he discovered in the human ostrich's stomach 129 straight pins, six hairpins, two horseshoe nails, 12 half-inch wire nails, two door keys, three chains, and a large ring. For me, the human ostrich's narrative functions as an emblem for Mary's imagination, a place dedicated to the continual astonishment called our world, and all about ingestion in its largest sense, whether corporeal, literary, or otherwise, a space of incongruity, multiplicity, interruption, pleasure, and pain, 
about how any brush with the body, whether textual or physical, is, as Mary suggests, a visceral and never merely an intellectual encounter. The human ostrich's narrative is also an emblem for Mary's way of being in the world, whether she is exploring such elusive topics as mood or uncomfortableness, or is biking from Prague to Dresden along the elbow with her partner Jean and two American friends, or delighting in the fact she was seated across from Norman Lear at a dinner here last week. Mary's way of being in the world exhibits a fierce curiosity about everything around her, a will to ingest it, as it were, cheer before the surprising juxtaposition, the sudden linkage, the creation of an amalgam of genres that include but is hardly limited to meticulously researched and wide-ranging cultural history, theory, folklore, dream work, letters, and lyrical personal recollections. The result is splendidly associative, revealing, humorous, poignant, eccentric, nuanced, and nothing if not consistently self-aware. The difference between art and entertainment, I want to say, often involves the speed of perception. Art deliberately slows and complicates reading, hearing, and or viewing so we can rethink and refeel form and experience. Entertainment deliberately accelerates and simplifies them so we don't have to think about or feel very much of anything at all. Mary's project is art all the way down, an ongoing dedication to defamiliarization through reflection in order to get us to see what has always already been there but has been hidden within that cloud of perceptive numbness Heidegger referred to as Alltäglichkeit, everydayness. Or, as Mary points out in Life Breaks In, a mood almanac, corners of which we'll be hearing this evening via a multimodal reading, the whole of which will be published next year by the University of Chicago Press. No sky is uniformly blue. It only appears that way to those who fail to notice it. That's what she's about in 17 words. That's her existential choreography. I could obviously go on and on about Mary's work, but it will be lots more fun, I guarantee you, to experience the thing itself rather than to listen to me going all metacognitive about it. <laughs> and so, a few brief biographical brass tacks, then we're off. Born in a suburb of Philadelphia, Mary earned her MA and PhD from SUNY Buffalo was a Fulbright lecturer at the Gorky Literary Institute in Moscow, and four years ago received a Guggenheim Fellowship in nonfiction. Currently, she is a professor of English and creative writing at the University of Rhode Island, where she teaches courses on, among other alluring subjects, literary acoustics, Emily Dickinson and Gertrude Stein, immigrant subjectivity and documentary discourse, and literature and medicine. She is author of four books and I believe I have this number right, 4,000 ongoing projects. <laughs> By way of conclusion, I, I just want to italicize how great it is to be back again among what feels like family at the American Academy. As uh, we were just told, my wife, uh, Andy, and I lived and worked here during the um, spring of 2013. And as you can see, it's now impossible to get rid of us. Our time on the shores of the Wannsee was nothing short of transformative, and Berlin's stunning cultural energy a daily invigoration. But enough about me. Please join me in welcoming the extraordinary Mary Capello. The gifts just keep coming here. I am so blessed. I was already in love with Lance Olson's work, and now I'm in love with him, obviously. <laughs> We'd never met tonight. Thank you so much. 
thank all of you. Thank you all for being here. I want to also acknowledge the entire staff of the Academy who in their singular and collective capacities have created a base and home for the ger germination of ideas and art to say nothing of great food. Thank you, Reinhardt and Gobby. I want to acknowledge my fellow fellows, I like to say that, and their partners, those gifted people whose company I have the privilege of sharing. And especially, I want to acknowledge Marie-Christine Mitzlaff for her savvy and determination in helping to bring some of you here this evening. My acknowledgement and deep thanks to Gerhard Kasper, our president, the imprint of whose wise influence here this year is palpable. There's nothing like the Stimmung here. In three short weeks, the tempo of our days and encounters has been luminous. And now tonight, this co-location of mutual presence, some new work I want to give you in the name of sound and mood and atmosphere. If you're already sleepy and dusk is playing about your eyelids, inviting the Moibis strip of dreams, that's OK. I'm not sure I want to wake you this evening, though I may want to invite you to float. As a writer of new nonfiction forms, I'm interested in how the essay works on attention, absorbs us, makes possible altered states, sidles up to a reader, and intimates. Like Joni Mitchell, I really don't know clouds at all. Unwieldy and amorphous from the get-go, clouds and their vaporous cousin, moods, aesthetic invitation to me as a writer is this. Not to chase it, track it, or pin it down, neither to explain or define mood, but to notice it, often enough to listen for it, and to do something like it without killing it in the process. The reading I've curated for you this evening is a kind of assemblage culled from the book nearing completion that following Virginia Woolf I call Life Breaks In, a mood almanac. And the uh, book unfolds in four movements, elements, charts, rooms, and my focus this evening, vibes or sonority. OK. I want to begin with a minute-long meditation born of an amateur recording that I made. Some of you may recognize it as a keynote to the landscape here at the American Academy, a kind of daily concert. It occurs at the edge of the lawn that rolls just beyond the windows here. So I invite you, if you wish to shut your eyes and allow these sounds to wash over you, consider the mood it strikes in you, in spite of the ridiculousness with which life will, alas, break in. Yeah, should have stopped, right? Should I hit stop or just stop? I don't know. Let's let me play it back. Make sure it works. Okay, I'm gonna play. It. You're not hearing anything. Mm. It's still recording. <laughs> One gong bath. All I had said was mood and sound and envelopes in response to the question, "What are you working on?" When a friend of mine invited me to an event, it would require $20, she said. It would last for about an hour. She said she thought I'd really get a lot out of a gong bath. 
Immediately, I pictured a take-me-to-the-river experience. I think I thought a midwife might be present. I needed to know if nakedness was a requirement or if a bathing suit was optional. I imagined a toga or endlessly unwinding winding sheet. The water would be turquoise-tinted and warm, bathtub warm, but bubbleless. Everything would depend on my willingness to go under, to experience a form of suspended animation. No doubt sounds would be relayed to me, underwater healing sounds, to which I'd be asked to respond with my eyes closed, all the while confident I would not drown. Then I remembered how my mother was ever unable to float, and how her fear of water fueled her determination that my brothers and I learned to swim early on. My mother can't swim, but throughout my childhood, she writes poetry in response to the call of a nearby creek that she studies and meditates near. I maintain an aversion to putting my head underwater even after I do learn how to swim. How can I ever push off or dive deep if my mother cannot float? No memory will be as flush with pattering. This is life as the sensation that is the sound of the garden hose, first nozzle tested as a fine spray into air, then plunged into three inches of water to refill a plastic backyard pool. The muffled gurgle sounds below, but I hear it from above. The nape of my neck is dry, my eyelids are dotted with droplets, and the basal sound of water moving inside of water draws me like the signal of a gong. Get in, get out get in. The water is cool above and warm below, or warm above and cool below. If I bend to touch its stripes, one of my straps releases and goes lank. Voices are reflections that do not pierce me here. They mottle. I am a fish in the day's aquarium. The gong bath turns out to be a middle-class group affair at a local yoga, stu yoga studio, not a private baptism in a subterranean <laughs> tub. The group of bourgeoisie of which I am a member pretends to, for a day to be hermits in a desert. It's summertime, and we arrive with small parcels, loosely dressed, jewelry-free, to each person her mat and a pillow to prop our knees. We're to lie flat on our backs, we're told, and try not to fidget. We're to shut our eyes and merely listen, while two soft-spoken men create sounds from differently sized Tibetan gongs that hang from wooden poles positioned in a row in front of us. Some of the gongs appear to have copper-colored irises at their center. In their muted state, they hang like unprepossessed harbingers of calm. At its furthest reaches, science's mood is poetry. At that point where it gives up on controlling the things it studies, agreeing instead to a more profound devotion to spare sounds whose tones the mysteries of existence brush up against asymptotically. The rustle of pages weighted with results, the fluttering of questions pondered in obscurity, the settling of a log on a forgotten fire, the hiss inside the grate. Even in its earliest incarnations, the science of acoustics turned to water as its scribe by dropping a pebble on a liquid surface plunk and watching the rings around it form. So too, mood finds a home in circles and widening gyres. The geometry that accompanies mood, whether for, back, sir, or gur, is round. And now these gongs, waiting to be struck, are also ringed from darkest center to shimmering edge. I know it will sound like I was tripping if I say I felt as though I was dropped down a watery chute inside a gong bath. The sounds slowed things down to the point of drugging my inner voice. Suddenly that voice was the cab of a hot air balloon that I had to climb up into to enter should I ever feel the need to return to it. Is it possible for the mind to revert to pure sound? I began to have a feeling I'd never known before. My eyes weren't rolling backwards into my head. This wasn't exactly an ecstatic state. Behind their closed lids, my eyes felt as though they were sliding to either side of my head. This must be what happens to us when we die, though I wasn't, for that moment, afraid of dying. The lover's discourse, any word uttered by the beloved, takes up residence in the lover's body and rings there unstoppably. 
this pang that requires Roland Barthes to halt all occupation, he calls reverberation. Without the aid of microphones or speakers, the sound of gongs materializes and reverberates in the supine body. For my own part, I felt sound enter through the palms of my hands and the heels of my feet. In the concert hall, a cough or sneeze, whisper or crunch is a too ready reminder of the body of our fellows in the room. At a rock concert, we maybe sway or sweat together in a half-high haze, but careful still to keep the edges of other bodies a blur. We pitch our tent on the edges of group oblivion. In the gong bath, other bodies are nodal points that sound bounces off of. I felt sound bounce off the body of the person next to me, onto me, and on down the line. I felt it in my stomach like a pang. Was I letting myself get all new age kooky, producing a form of socially acceptable psychedelia that has no basis in fact? That sound can affect the central nervous system goes without saying. That sound can therefore be harnessed therapeutically to allay pain or alter the course of a disease has never been the drawing card of modern Western medicine. A little research can go a long way, and a student of mine once made me aware of prescribable sounds or audioceuticals. Vibroacoustic therapy is discounted as simply silly, along the order of overly priced vibrating easy chairs, until someone gives a sound massage to a person with Parkinson's and finds that circulation is enhanced and rigidity decreased. White noise is a treatment for ADHD, vibrating insoles to help the elderly maintain balance, or the space-age sounding sonoprep, a skin permeation device through which a blast of low-frequency ultrasonic waves opens a pore in the skin in lieu of a needle, suggests territories we've barely begun to broach. Though neither I nor anyone I know has been offered a non-invasive therapy tool that can liquefy tumors of the prostate and the breast or sonically bore a tiny hole into an infant's deformed heart valve, the sound technology and its practitioners apparently do exist. What's this got to do with mood? Oceanographers tell us that sound moves faster in water than it does in air. But isn't air part liquid? They say they can measure qualities of sound that are impossible to hear. They observe that sound pushes particles together and pulls them apart, and that sound is the effect of a material's compression and expansion. When they add that the speed of sound in water is dependent on night or day, temperature, weather, and locale, I begin to feel I'm in the realm of sound with mood. So too, when they describe a dolphin's kerplunk as a slap of a tail on water to keep an aggressor at bay, when they note a whale's moans, groans, tones, and pulses, and a seal's underwater clicks, trills, warbles, whistles, and bells, I begin to glimpse a mood, part C. A philosopher steps in and says the body itself is a skin stretched over resonant matter beneath. We are our own water-filled drums of emotionality and indigestion, of sounds and moods. A poet parts ways to say that water is sound. Sound creates moods. All mood is aqueous sound. It's the feeling a gong bath gives of encountering sound beneath a threshold, submerged and then absorbed, absorbed that makes me ally sound with mood as liquid. The gong bath doesn't affect my mood. It's the model for a mood. It is a mood, and it can't be reproduced. It says that mood and sound meet at the place of touching. Sounds touch me, and mood is the window of allowance, wide or narrow, to let sound in. My moods are equivalent to what I let myself touch and be touched by in turn, but also what I have no choice in the matter of being encased in. A tongue stuck to a frozen pole, bare feet in mud, the bare of your back, the sting of my words. If I were a cat, touch would create a purring machine. If you overtouch me, I swat. Give us this day our daily sounds. How conscious are we of our ability to create our own soundscape exclusive of earbuds? How will you tune your day? 
What will you tune into with no instruments at your disposal but your whistle and gait? Lest I seem to idealize my $20 experience, I should note that 50 minutes was way too long a time for listening to gongs. <laughs> Five minutes would have had the same effect, but the gong players wanted to give us our money's worth. Every gong bath since my first one has left me cold. They've really flopped. In subsequent baths, I never got past the all too probable tendency to supply an image to every sound I heard, even entire narratives. Though the images were as unconsciously imbued, inexplicable, and private as those one experiences in dreams, I remained a translator stranded upon a shore and not a bather immersing down and in. The images were dark, a boy shivering in his coat before drowning, my open mouth attempting but unable to pronounce Jean's name. There was a toucan and a typewriter, an avalanche of marbles, a body encased in wax. Having stirred up some unpleasantly tinged flotsam and jetsam, the gong bath left me feeling bereft, unlike great music that moves us, as Peter Kivy once wrote, because it is expressive of sadness, not by making us sad. Sad music puts us in an exalted mood, rendering us capable of experiencing the expression of sadness. In order for a gong bath to work, sound has to obliterate language for a spell so we can touch mood's casement its resonant <laughs> shell. We have to be coaxed by sound to suspend our image-making tendencies, even if pure sound, pure mind, like pure sound, is impossible. But why should we try? After my first gong bath, I was convinced the phenomenon was going to become the audioceutical fad for 21st century Americans. It could join the ranks of our half-understood borrowings from traditions not our own, providing an opiate to the all too comfortable classes, a soother to a wine. My prediction was a way of denying that I was in search of something, of an experience deeply felt, and not just an observer doing field work. I want it to be invited to go under while you provide the sounds, to shed anticipation and bathe in curiosity, alive for a spell in the day's aquarium. Two, tenor of the times. A lot has been written about music and mind, but what about music as mind? What type of Rorschach would it be to free associate a type of music to each person in your life, or even to strangers on a train or in a waiting room? Jean, Thelonious Monk. Mom, an aria from Aida. Dad, the racket of a neighbor boy trying to play a trumpet. <laughs> My friend who tends a wild garden, cacophonous bluegrass. Older brother no number one, the national anthem. Older brother number two, chopsticks. You there, the sound a bowling alley makes, and you, the needling harmonics of a fingernail across a chalkboard. Each of us is a music minus a symphony reliant on strut. Who am I to say you are essentially a garage band? Some people have a more versatile instrumentarium, a xylophone in one corner of the mind, a reed organ in the other, available for instigating a song in the heart, irreducible to a tune in the head. But wherefore the access to a fluent glissando on a roll-top piano for some, while others live the mood of their days as one-note Johnnies? Perhaps we are all tenors without vehicles. You wake and strap on your mood accordion, but you are without a town fair or a smoky cafe where vodka flows and kippered snacks. The accordion gets heavy after a while of being without a place for it until one day you trade it in for a pair of dented trash can lids. A world in which everyone is compelled to try his hand at the zither could not be a happy place. <laughs> a Rorschach is not the same as a work of art. Take the artful cartoons a young artist, only 12 years old, made from her place at a table with adults. Translating each person into an animal which she sketched, she seemed to catch something of the essence of each. And she was witty without being mean. She found the right girth and grin for each of our personalities. To each, 
she granted the playful powder of a mood, and almost everyone was lent one or more tiny accoutrements that perfectly adhered to them, like the distillation of a tell. Jean was a lynx with curling whiskers, one pierced ear, and a tiny crown. The child had discovered in us a beanie coptered beagle, a wine glass wielding elephant, a bow bedecked crocodile, and a woolly ewe. Even the waiter, a presumed stranger to us all, suddenly grew into the decked out aura of his own singularity. A maraschino cherry hung from one of his spangled horns, no doubt a reference to the condescending fruit he adorned the child's Shirley Temple with. And his animal, unlike everyone else but me, was also granted a word. That one word was G. If everyone else was their animal noun, a flamingo, a hippo, I was asked to mesh more fully with my animal as adjective, squirrely. I was also supplied a great many dedicated details. It was a real study. In homage to my squirreliness, I wore shoes that bore the imbricated patterns of an acorn that rhymed with a matching choker at my neck. In my right hand, a book with the defining monosyllabic title, Poe. Above my head, a thought bubble filled in with a mysterious content, Jimmy cracked corn and I don't care. <laughs> Whether the child had captured a mood competitive or highfalutin, dumbfounded or laissez-faire, I cannot say, only that she had gotten something of me right that I certainly could never be made capable of seeing for myself. Which may explain why, in musical Rorschach mode, I neglected to ascribe a type of music to myself, failing to admit the music that comes to mind where I try to put myself before myself is Gregorian chant. It's impossible to hear the sound of our own voice, just as we can't ever perceive ourselves being perceived. We can't really know the shape of the mood in which we regularly reside. When we speak of the tenor of our times, we don't mean Caruso or Pavarotti. We don't anticipate a fellow human who most beautifully intones we mean to suggest the pervading intonation. I would like, however, for there to be a tenor for these times. The sweet voice of a man pitched high up, higher than the eye can see. When I try to think who the tenor of these times might be, three, Sono photo, boy screaming. It must have been the absence of a flash at dusk, <clears throat> combined with the relative shade of my backyard garden, that yielded an entire roll of mostly blank birthday pictures that year. The conditions, combined with a cranky camera, weren't going to make it possible for any images to materialize which must be why I received the one photo that partially did turn out a four-year-old Kolya screaming as a tonic. <laughs> He's a trace in this soliloquizing picture and yet so vividly visible. There's a hue of a bare leg, it was summertime, and a broad white band of a striped shirt against the gray-green dark. Most especially, there's an audibly visible face, the angle of whose eyes show the boy to be smiling, mischievously, triumphantly, at the same time that he screams. His whole ghost-like figure tilts, as if spinning inside the vertigo created by his cry, or maybe it just made the photographer woozy while the boy himself remained protected. This is my favorite detail. He's plugged his own ears with his fingers. When Kolya was not that much younger, his father, my friend Arthur, chalked up the extremity of Kolya's antics to the terrible twos. But I never went in for that. The energy of Kolya's fervor was unique, or at least strictly his. He was his own heat, light, and energy generating machine, which is how this photograph came to be. Against the absence of light and the possibility of a reproducible image, Kolya produces what physicists call sonoluminescence. Investigators still aren't entirely in agreement about how it happens, but they have observed emissions of regularly pulsing in picoseconds, eerie blue light occasioned by high-frequency sound waves just beyond the range of human hearing, 
as they bombard an air bubble suspended in water. Imagine finding ways to measure what goes on inside of tiny air bubbles as they react to sound, heat up, collapse, and emit a different form of energy, light. To say that Kolya's scream was sonoluminescent is far from scientifically accurate. But what he occasioned with his voice is more than metaphor. The literal projection of his being as an emanating source of temperature and tempo, of atmosphere and mood. Now I wonder about the nature and quality of his photograph scream. How high was it pitched? And to what extent did it muffle or mute the other ambient noises of that early evening backyard scene? I once purposely left my camera home on a trip to an unfamiliar country, deciding to record nothing but a range of sounds as remembrance of the places we'd visited, from those that created an accidental ambiance, a voice suddenly singing in an alleyway, to those that alerted me to the distinctness of the place, the uncommon to me clapper that signaled an approaching train, cowbells on a hillside, voices in a restaurant, and especially the tune of clanking silverware floating through apartment windows at midday. I was convinced somehow that the sounds would offer a truer sense of the place than any two-dimensional picture plane could. If I reassembled the sounds when I got home, could I create something out of view about the place, but imminent? A video couldn't have accomplished the recreation of an atmosphere since sounds would be subordinated once again. Sounds by themselves, sounds and nothing but, have the effect of replacing else elsewhere. They bring us back, far, far back. And they bring us out and over to land in an extraneous zone, for sounds untethered are both reaching and vault-like. They emit a volume and an architecture, a substance and a shadow. But here I fall back on the language of images once again. If we must have images, if we're never without images, and I do love my photograph of boy screaming, then how about a sono photo or an audio pic? Neither a moving image nor still images with wallpaper musical playlists made to match the images after the fact. A sono photo asks to be a still image with, let's say, an accompanying audio chip as a record of the sounds that were synchronous with the subject caught that day at the very moment of its catching. For every predictable occasional shot, there'd have to be an unanticipated suite of sounds and voices, burps and bumps, to mark the pick as such and bubble up from it and merge with it to surround it like a sphere. Audio picks would register the tones that collectively jostle a moment's mood into being. Photographs might seem less bereft then. They'd not be lent a missing sound, don't get me wrong. The idea wouldn't be to animate the life we seek to reproduce, but to let it emerge and recede into its native sea of sound, albeit necessarily clipped and cut. Here's where a challenge would have to be met, because what would determine how long or short the photos accompanying sound recording should be? A split second wouldn't do for a palpable mood song. You'd need at least several seconds for the sounds to be meaningful, or maybe not. Maybe the whole point of sono photos would be to train our attention differently, to give us what we otherwise can't hear as distinguishing and vital and exceedingly short. It's the nature of sound to vanish, but memory seems to require the sense of a sustaining chain. Would such sounds fizz around a photograph like tiny bubbles? or create one large gelatinous frame. Froth, according to an Aristotelian model of temperament and physique, is the euphoric counterpart to black bile. But the four humors only allow for choleric, phlegmatic, melancholic, and sanguine. This photograph of my boy screaming, though, could serve as a woodcut illustration to a type of mood euphoric, in which the figure has surrounded himself with a bubble of light. How long or short did he sustain it, that scream? Was it sharp and fleeting like a yelp or long and lasting far beyond the boundaries of a measured exhale? By the look of Collier's self-constructed earplugs, it was exceedingly loud and high-pitched. Was the whole point of the scream a test of how far he could throw his voice for how long? Collier used to like to run his fingers along the side of a balloon to make a squawking sound 
then see how many squawks and pinches it would take until it popped. I used to like rubbing a balloon against the fuzzy surface of a rug, then take pleasure in the way it would stick with crackly static to different body parts. If I let Kolya's screaming photograph help me to remember one of my own mood calls, a zone both sheltering and porous created by sound, I find myself returning to a very early scene from childhood set before the glow of a TV set, a glow that seemed an effect of its shutters drawn, evenly lambent, groaning. I almost wrote, in the dream, but it wasn't a dream. It was an episode, and it wasn't an episode on TV, but in my life. I was too young at the time to understand images or words, so it's not really possible that I was following whatever was on TV. I was held, however, inside the television's emanating light and the sounds that came through its coarse and fuzzy speaker. I was busy with the unselfconscious activity of cutting my own hair with a pair of blunt-edged, pink-handled, child-sized scissors. I wasn't trying to accomplish anything, but I was busy feeling something, something that sounded like what I sensed when I lost my feet inside of granules of sand on a beach. I was timelessly exploring when a scream burst through that was at first my mother crying, Oh no, Mary, what have you done? <laughs> Followed by my own drop out of the zone and imitative screaming in turn. The number of lessons I was to learn forced me to attention. One, one is never to cut one's own hair. That's only something an insane person does. <laughs> Two, scissors are not to be played with. Three, your own head is one thing and your doll's head is another, though you also shouldn't cut the hair off your doll. <laughs> Four, bubbles are not safe zones. Moods are easily broken by the cries of adults. Life breaks in to terminate the mood, leaving me to wonder whether moods have their own temporality, their own terminus based on their own end point. I mean, how long would my hair cutting activity have gone on inside my bubble if I hadn't been stopped? When do you decide you are finished? When the body calls you back with hunger, a bowel movement, the need to sleep? How long is the length of your scream? What form does your cry take? Which of your cries has gone unheard, unanswered? When is a mood the effect of a scream that doesn't require the presence of another? We speak of people creating bubbles around themselves when we want to suggest a self-insulating shield of complacency, immunity, or ignorance. But insofar as we are all equipped with voices capable of generating heat and light, tone and atmosphere, we are all reliant on self-propelling mood spheres to carry us through our days. So much depends, I know you want to hear Red Wheelbarrow, but so much depends on the pliancy or porousness of our bubbles their susceptibility to air currents or tendency to stick. Within the first 10 seconds of birth, each of us takes our first breath when our central nervous system responds to the sudden change in temperature. It sounds like a gasp. A developing baby produces two times more heat than an adult. The womb is a relatively sterile environment. A newborn might be covered in a thick, waxy substance that helps a baby float in amniotic fluid. It will slough off in the baby's first bath. When Kolya turned six, I gave him a story that I wrote for him about a cardinal. I can't remember the story's plot, except that it was inspired by the suddenness of the bird's red presence in the garden one early April afternoon. I remember bestowing the bird with the power of anointing the boy who found him with just that, a mutually supervening presence of witnessing and being witnessed in turn. When Kolya turned eight, I gave him morning glory seeds since never expecting to outpace his high achieving sister and unbeknownst to him, greens flourished in the plot his parents had give, given over to his care. You have a green thumb, I told him then. A green what? He screwed up his face and scratched his head, inspecting his thumb through squinting eyes. He shrugged. Whatever, he said, and hey, will these morning glories climb the fence? I always gave Kolya books, but as he approached 11 and then 12, finding the right gift for him became difficult. 
He'd moved through a Minecraft stage fervently and swiftly. And now his head lay buried in a game he played on his phone in which physiognomies of actual soccer pros, tiny as cells under a microscope, scrabbled and pitched inside a field Kolya could hold in his hand. The best gift you can give a 12-year-old boy, a friend of mine explained, is a lava lamp. <laughs> she was right. He was thrilled. What's the deal with 21st century boys and lava lamps? Their undulating bubbles and incandescent hues are mood simulators par excellence. They set a pace of even-keeled ejaculation for a boy on the brink of losing control. Their compressed screams, bottled, now gently gurgling. Kolya rarely screams now. He's very dear and very sweet. He's gentlemanly. And it almost breaks my heart the way he still hugs me unabashedly, still turning his, he his ear to face my chest. The older we both get, hello and goodbye. The most recent footage I have of him once again places us in the garden. It involves water in slow motion and the staged humiliation of being soaked by it. It's August, by the looks of it, when everything is at its blooming best and end. It's hot. Kolya is showing me and Jean and his father how to use an iPhone to make videos in slow motion. First, he directs his father to stand at expressionless attention while pulling the trigger of a spray bottle once, twice, three times for a five second long show. The light on this day couldn't be better for capturing the slowly articulated mist and with it sounds coiled and elongated, sheathed by the spray. The camera phone's on off button now a xylophone tongue struck by a ball-shaped mallet. Bird chirps turned to underwater space creature boings, high-pitched voices hammered into low-lying animal growls. A second video is more elaborately staged, but equally short and amusing. Father and son face one another in their matching blue t-shirts. Kolya pushes his father, whose rehearsed reflex, complete with overblown, exacerbated facial expressions, is to toss the water from his wine glass onto Kolya as he bounces back. This is the point of the film, to capture water in slow motion as they beat it, pelt, and splat as it traverses a distance of two feet between two facing bodies. At the end of the water arc, droplets fall to make a necklace of dashes that punctuate Kolya's chest and chin. He's plastered but beneath shut eyes, he beams a full-toothed grin. Now the birds are aharmonic, like those in an Amazonian rainforest, while a slow, ultra-deep human voice can almost be heard to say, Don't ruin the iPhone. <laughs> this, no doubt, in reference to the liquid nature of the scene. The rose petals singed at their edges emit a pom-pom thrumming, their scent made more sugary by the damp. Red geranium petals peel, and the dogwood releases its coppery downpour in the shade. The point of the game is to make something mind-bending, and in the process, to get drenched. Like his four-year-old scream, the gale is tuneless and unstoppable. It creates a mood of madcap inside an urban paradise. For five full seconds, we all laugh and laugh and laugh. And one last short piece to close. The hypothalamic nuclei are connected to the cerebral cortex, whose functioning underlies meaning. But how? And also to the limbic lobe of the brainstem, whose functioning underlies affects. 
At present, we don't know how this transfer takes place, but clinical experience allows us to think that it actually does take place. For instance, one will recall the exciting or sedative opiatic effect of certain words. For and finally, the exciting or opiatic effect of certain words. When Julia Kristeva talks about the sedative or opiatic effect of certain words, I don't think she has in mind the mood-altering capacity of the meanings that accompany words, those bulky overcoats, even though that word meaning appears in her gloss. I suspect she's talking about words as sound forms whose texture and timber have the power to, as the saying goes, touch something in us, and in the touching to either create a new mood, if such a thing is possible, or to conjure the residue of a mood that's gone missing. Psychophonologists read high frequency sounds as capable of producing states of heightened awareness in we humans, acting as they do on the cochlea, whereas low frequency sounds can calm us to the point of stasis and torpor. If the liquid inside the semicircular canals of the ear's vestibule is made to rotate enough by repeated low frequency drumming, for example, a, tr a state of trance is the result. Then we are said to be captives of our vestibules. But what, if, what about the effect of language on our neurobiological networks? Is it possible to identify words that at one time made us happy, exclusive of candy? And how about words that exert a drone or din? Just as worry is easier to bear in a particular place, worry is easier to bear surrounded by particular words. Can words in themselves have this power, or does it depend on the quality of the air through which m words move? There's the rub. Doesn't it all come down to voice, the ineluctable wooing of one by the other, word and voice, ear and tongue and throat, lips and lungs? If pronounced in her voice, all words create the best mood in me. That's the ticket. All distinctions fall away. Use the next full minute to list words that come to mind as likely to produce a soothing or pleasant mood in you. Go. Denizen versus citizen. Hula hoop versus tire iron. Glockenspiel versus man of war. Harmonica versus accordion. Charlotte. But now we're back to ice cream or dessert. Swarthy, swatch, and glade. Recluse and surcease. Recant and disuse. Delve, shelve, elve. Elevate and conjugate. Jugular and jaguar. Constantinople. Fructify. Gina Lola Brigida. Riff raff, rinky dink. Edgeless leavening. Sausalito. Somersault. The mood-producing effects of such words must have to do with the nap of each person's individual fur, each person's causeway-like zags, marbleized or plush, the orientation and density of our inner and outer linings, and maybe too with the mechanics of an accident rise and fall of the voices that originally coaxed us into being. Come out, come out, they said. For now it's time to come out. Or sleep now. They're there. It's time to sleep. We leave it to poets to return language to its roots in the body, to restore language's place amid the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. A sentence can move as mesmerically as reversing falls, falls like the small and quiet ones hidden inside trees, more majestic than those that pound, pound for pound and measure for measure, weight of their fo force drawn down, down or up, the sentence, sentence to reverse itself, to meet but not to find itself again, drawn back upon itself, not by itself alone, alone upon a pad, this pen and that heart draws it forth and back until a feeling is produced by it and then it stops. We turn to poets, or to the poets we ourselves become, when called to attention by distillates, even in the most analytic prose. Then I gather such phrases for their capacity to say everything that needs to be said, that are in themselves all the mood thought we need to understand depression, for example. As from Kristeva, the word spools, institutionalized stupor, prisoners of affect, the delights of suffering, Nick Themeral rhythms, our most persistent despondencies, 
to tame and cherish sadness as an object for lack of another, a lucid counter-depressant, to unfold languages' resources, our basic homeostatic recourses, faced with the impossibility of concatenating, learned helplessness, playing dead, psychic crypts, or psychic voids. In order to effect a mood out of language, need a writer put words through the same process that herbs are subjected to in the creation of mood-enhancing cordials? Steeping, distilling, infusing, and macerating, all of which share the requirement of soaking and softening, condensing and extracting, supply the idea of a liquid aesthetic. And who wouldn't wish to produce in a fellow being the combination hum and high of cranberries soaked in vodka? Maybe a poet's charge is to unsteep words, and in doing so, to perform an only seemingly simple operation of extraction to allow us to hear what we never hear inside the words we always hear. For I know, I am put in a mood part joyful and part curious, not an opiatic mood, but a wakeful one, when met with the word seemly over and against the more commonplace unseemly, when prompted to imagine a shoveled rather than disheveled appearance, to be made to consider what whelms me as distinct from what overwhelms me, to comprehend the way in which each repetition is a renewed petition, to find loose-leaf pages a choir at the center of all requirements and inquiries, to posit positively against the forces of certain words tendency to exist only in negation, to eke out the coate in the inchoate, the ain in the inane, to bibe and bue without, cons without a consuming im, to saturate. Occasionally, you'll hear it on the radio, how the confident mood of capitalism turns hysterical. Then mad throngs storm the vestibules of Walmart, intent on a widescreen TV, trampling to death a guard in the process. What words create the frequencies to inspire mass motility, numb to the sound of voice and tongue and throat, lips and lungs, heart and mind, and memory pulsing underfoot? I think of Thoreau's different drummer, of Dickinson's poetry of tilt and whirl. I wonder if poetry undelivered, distant but there, poetry requiring that we crane just long enough to pause indeterminately, can avert the disaster of stampede. Thank you, and that's where I'll close tonight. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to have psychic voids on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That's um, work I've not shared with an audience yet, except for you. My pleasure. This is new. And everything is new. I was saying at dinner to Regina that um, uh, going first, of course, is lovely. Oh. <laughs> um, but that the disadvantage is that you don't get to see how my work will change um, under the influence of Berlin and my, my fellow fellows and all the incredible people I'm meeting tonight. I was thinking it might make for an interesting uh, uh, event for maybe fellows to come back as before and after. It won't be like the National Enquirer, Enquirer hopefully, but um, you know, the before and after. So this is what my work became after. Um, you don't know that yet, and neither do I, but this is where I am now. I suppose we'll entertain comments, questions, moods, um, <laughs> reactions. You know, a lot of this work, as maybe you have a sense, is about um, stirring, um, stirring things more than anything else. So uh, I'm really open to whatever it is you want to say. Let's just, just so it doesn't devolve into a, an AA meeting or anything like that.
Thank you very much. I was struck you. by something you said, I think about 40% of the way through, when you referred to a picture as being bereft mm. and mm -hmm. in, in need of being completed, a need of completion by um, the sound that might be associated with it. Yeah. Now, does that hold across a whole range of sentences? Would a sound and a picture together still be incomplete? Oh. How far? How far does this really go? I mean, yeah. I'm struck by the sure. I'm struck sure. by the idea of bereft. Sure, it, it sure, it's true. But yeah, um, we're always bereft. Yeah. I can't solve that. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, so we're ne ne never complete. It's, yeah. it's so. It, so thank you, Philip. It's not really about completion, and I appreciate that thought. It's not as though the sound would complete would, would finish something. You it's know? more about enrichment. Enrichment, um, I don't even know if I would call it enrichment because that also sounds like the sound would add something to the photograph. I don't wish for this sense of an additive, uh, an ornament. It's, it has more to do with the sense of um, what we're missing, this whole, this whole aspect of, the, of the, the, the lived life, you know, when we decide that, that photographs are going to be uh, what, we, what we use to to remember and mark and convey and uh, and refine ourselves in, and it just seems to me we never we never seem to think. Uh, what I've often thought when I look at a picture, um, I want to hear what what we were saying at the table when, <laughs> who was laughing, what was the clang of the uh, the dinner uh, going on in the background, you know. And uh, yes, so it has more to do with the sense that uh, I really think that we're, we're missing. A very large piece, a very essential piece of um, of the felt and experienced world in in not reproducing sound as much as we do but image, the video camera, but enriching the not video per se. Camera is still not. I, the video camera doesn't do it for me because the video camera just subordinates sounds, and um, this would really require choosing also which sounds um, would accompany. Can we can we patent this and make a fortune so I can stop teaching? I love teaching, but I've done it for many years. <laughs> I am surprised that no one has invented this, the sono photo or audio pic. Maybe we'll do it this term. There are people here who have the means, I know, that I don't. But I will continue to think about bereftness. I realized I used the word twice, not a good sign. <laughs> um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, you talked about the, going on holiday and only using sound as a memory yes. and not photographs. Do you find, did you find that, that brought the holiday back to you as vividly as with pictures, as only pictures mm -hmm. or differently? Right. Differently, differently. Um, you know, you could also tell me what the effect is on you when you, uh, have you ever recorded sounds of a place and then, you know, what is it like when you listen? We know about the power of the voice, for example. So we, we know for certain. Right? Those of us who have lost people, and um, when you hear the voice recorded, there's nothing that replaces that. A photograph cannot do that. The signature that is the voice, the fleetingness of the voice, the, um, the utter ephemerality of the voice, but then to be able to be in its presence. And of course, you know, I talked about this very briefly in my three-minute uh, gambit last week, but uh, I love, there's an idea that I try to be inspired by in my book, uh, elaborated by Didier Anzieux, a French psychoanalyst, who talks about what he calls a sonorous envelope, and this notion that uh, we are lent our sense of skin uh, touch, not only by the touch of others as babies, but by the voices of our earliest caretakers, and that the voice creates an envelope that is both, it's precarious, but it's also necessary. Um, you know, it's porous, but it offers some sense of being held. So nothing to me, there's nothing to me like the sound of a fellow human being's voice. And if, if that's what I'm using to remember, most absolutely that will always um, do more and differently than a photograph. When you bring the sounds back from a place where you've been, you know, um, uh, I, I use this sentence in the piece that's something like it, it brings you, it, it launches you and kind of it has this um, vault, uh, pole vaulting-like <laughs> effect, I find, that sound enables us to move over vast distances uh, Im of the imagination and of memory in ways that I find that um, the photographs do not. I don't want to give a bad rap 
Raptor Power events. It's a silly thing actually to say these sorts of things about photographs as though they're, you know, one thing absolutely and for all time. But but insofar as we're we're trying to address the uh, subordination of sound, I will I will say that for now. Thanks, Hi. Thanks very much for for oh. a very rich talk. I was wondering how much, when you talked about the words at the end, more like words and sounds. I'm wondering how much really depends on being native, uh, native in a language. Can you do that also in a language that's maybe one yeah. that you've learned later? Because I yeah. think that sound and voices. You just said about the psyche, and others just said, well, there's this envelope of the voice mm -hmm. around the word. Or mm -hmm. if you say in Kuei or Kuei, then it, you can only yeah. actually enjoy that because... I'm a native speaker? Because, yes, and because you let yourself be surprised by a different way of playing with words. Mm -hmm. Can you do the same, really? I mean, isn't, isn't like sound and voice also something that adheres to language and lets us you know, be transported into these moods? And can you do that, mm -hmm. let's say, in Italian? In Italian. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. I was just wondering. Well, the sure. background is a little bit that, that you can acquire a language as something that you love, mm -hmm. but, but also because it's somehow a little bit away from sure. the not so nice associations mm -hmm. that you maybe have yeah. with your native language. Sure. I don't, I'll try to answer. I'm not sure if I will be able to, but um, I mean, I'll give you an example maybe of my experience of German here as a non natives, not native, I don't even, you know, <laughs> neither educated speaker or, or native <laughs> speaker. <laughs> um, when we first got here, I started hearing German while I was falling to sleep. I mean, it's just what I would hear in my head rather than the voice thinking in English. And I started to, to notice that my sentences were, when I was writing emails and such, they were turning into a kind of what I would call broken English. So, and I was very aware of the rhythms of German. I'm sorry that, you know, at the moment I don't know that I can describe them for you. I should be able to, but I don't know that I can do that right now. But that, okay, but this is to say that it's not my language, but there's no question that I'm being surprised, I'm being altered, you know, um, and, and I don't know that you need to know a language in order to have experiences of, of surprise, you know, and, uh, yeah, Ex be, to be able to extract, extract it from itself, etc. Yeah. I mean, you know, I love the Deleuzean notion that the great writer is the person who inhabits her language like a foreigner. And so, you know, I never think of myself as a native speaker of English. I don't know what that would mean. You know, we are all speakers of, of multiform, polymath, polyvocal, languages. Um, the, the number of voices I have internalized from the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart, um, <laughs> you know, to the people who are speaking to me here in our encounters. So uh, I, I don't think there is a language that, that I speak or that, that you speak. No, no single, no one language. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in the idea of, you know, how, what voice is and, and is this voice that I'm speaking to you in, is it, a, is it an amalgam of all of these internalized voices? In what sense is it my own voice? How is the voice that I write in? Very little, I think, is still understood or, or per properly theorized about what we call the voice of a piece of writing. Um, it often, you know, is that, how is the voice of the piece of writing distinct from my, the voice I think in, the voice I speak in? And for me, tone is so crucial. Um, I hope you don't mind this free associating answer, right? So tone and voice have everything to do with one another and much of my writing is meant to be uh, a running athwart what I find to be an impoverishment of tone in my, we won't call it my native land, <laughs> in the United States, you know? And so um, we were talking about breast cancer a bit with one another. And um, to take one example of many in my writing life, and in my lived life, one of the things I had to deal with when I went through uh, treatment for breast cancer was 
the tone with which I was addressed. It was scary and horrifying. It was infantilizing. It was vapid. There was no range. You weren't allowed to be angry. How about a writing that is ecstatic at this time? How about a, how about a language that um, is enraged? Could I find a way to um, really offer a tonal range that was unavailable to me? And that to me was the, you know, if, if I could offer something, contribute something, that, that's what I had hoped to do. So a long way round, I hope I sort of answered your question. Mary, yes. you have now intimidated me because I'm sometimes accused of not hitting the right tone. <laughs> and, and, and therefore, it's, it, is, it is very difficult, whatever I'm going to say now. Um, and not being a native English speaker, of course, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware that I must have missed at least as much as I grasped. So okay. I, I wonder how, how even the, the native speakers you know, would... Mm -hmm. um, tally what they got out of it. But in any event, it was more than enough for me to make this very worthwhile. I, I really want Thank to say you. that. Thank My you. question is a very mundane one. Um, you said at the outset that your presentation is um, from the book that oh, yes. you are about to complete. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether the verbal part of your presentation how close is that to what you are writing in the book? Mm -hmm. is, is, this, is there much of a variation? Mm -hmm. Or is what we heard very close to what you're putting on paper? That's a great, thank you so much. It's a great question. First, let me say that um, atonality is wonderful, maybe more interesting. So I'm thrilled that you never hit the right tone. And um, I'd be interested to know what you heard. We could talk about that later because that's, that's just so interesting to me. You know, what did you hear and um, without English as, as your native language? This is drawn directly from the book, yes. So this is partly how the book sounds. But the book also, I hope, enjoys a tonal range. And part of my difficulty, this was the most difficult book I've ever written, don't ask me, you know, mood, it's, I, I spoke with a, another writer a few months ago, going for a walk, she was asking me about what I'm doing, and she said, I'm really glad somebody's writing about something a lot more vague than I am, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was just way too big, and of course, it's, it's all about the unrepresentable. Um, so at first, I thought that I would try to create a literary form that heretofore did not exist. Um, cloud writing, I would think of it as. Could I create a literary form that could approximate what I think might be the nature of clouds and clouds having a kinship with moods? That proved, I'm afraid, impossible. And it started to feel too artificial. This is always a problem when one tries to invent forms. But I'm of the mind that we should always be creating new forms when we write. And so even though I'm described as an essayist or a lyric essayist or a creative nonfiction writer, I hope that each of my books um, is, uh, and is the form, is equivalent to the form that was called for by the problem or question that I was pursuing. And so this, you know, this book, to say it, it's in four movements, um, uh, I did try to orchestrate it in a way. Um, the sound segments that I read to you actually work as glue between these segments. So there are short form sonic episodes that work as a kind of glue between the four movements. And then the book arrives ultimately though at a, a longer meditation just on sound. And um, so, but no, it does sound differently. And I hope, I hope you heard difference even within these these passages, I love to, to cite Roland Barthes. I, I love Roland Barthes, the French philosopher um, who, who tried to write novels and at the end of it all, he said, the end of his life, he said, you know, I have only written essays, only, he's a genius, right? But only, I've only written essays, an ambiguous form in which analysis vies with writing. And I feel like that, that's what is always happening in my work and so, you know, the, the voice of analysis. I love that voice. I was trained in it as a scholar. And I, 
I, I honor the scholarly voice, but I never want the poet to be too far away. You know, they have to come into the same place. Thank you very much. I really oh, enjoyed the thank talk. You. And um, I have to say I was a bit surprised maybe by uh, the emphasis on sound because when I think about mood, mm -hmm. um, I think so much about atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I think about interiors. I think about smell and places and um, so it's the senses in a, yeah. you know, in a very broad way. And mm -hmm. I, I wondered, um, if your connection or if your focusing on sound was part of a way of honing for the book or mm -hmm. if um, mood um, in your writing in this work uh, is also touching on those other yes. ways of sensing yes. the mood of places and situations. Sure. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. I came to mood about 10 years ago. I've been thinking about this for about 10 years. Um, there are a lot of interruptions. <laughs> Life breaks in, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was sound that first took me to wanting to write, uh, write toward mood, beside it, around it, not about it. And I think it was by way of Didi Anzieux to begin with, but also because I had read this was more like 15 years ago, an essay by Diana Fuss, the great literary theorist about Emily Dickinson, in which she very convincingly suggested that in order to understand Dickinson's aesthetic, we might have to revisit the rooms in which she did her writing. And she worked together with an architect to try to map this. And I thought, this is so wonderful. But Dickinson was really so much a person of the ear, much more so than a, a person of of the eye. And so I thought, well, how about the acoustics of that space? You know, her uh, brother was having sex downstairs with uh, Mabel Loomis, you know, uh, pretty frequently. So the sound of like orgasm down there and uh, well, you know, all, all sorts of things that would constitute the acoustics, the acoustics of space. I thought the acoustics of space, could we revisit the rooms for the acoustics of space? Could that help us to understand her aesthetic? And just when I had this thought, you know, someone sent me an email saying, hey, there's this new field that's just announced itself called sound, you know, <laughs> sound studies. <laughs> and they're having a conference in Amsterdam and they're uh, raising the, the very sorts of questions I was interested in. So it really was by way of sound that I came to mood. But there are all sorts of other sonic, sonic, um, keynotes that brought me there, that I was haunted by a, a sentence in uh, one of my grandfather's journals. He was a shoemaker from Teano, Italy, who taught himself English and wrote in both languages, never really took himself seriously as a writer, but left behind mounds and mounds of philosophical musings, and he really was a poet. And at one point in one of his journals, he writes the sentence, the same adagio persists with us, no change in our behavior. And so it's things like this. Um, what would it mean to describe a day or life as an adagio? Um, that having resonance with mood. I lost, I, my hearing was harmed by chemotherapy. You know, I have been told, no offense to 80 year old hearing people in the room, but I was told by an autologist, you know, a few months ago that I have the hearing of an 80 year old. Um, so all of, all of these th things um, formed, I would suppose, a, a cluster of, of motivations to follow sound with mood. But indeed, um, a large part of the book deals with rooms. In fact, the longest portion of the book um, is settled inside of what I call the, the mood rooms of a natural history museum in an off the beaten path museum called um, the Elsie Bates Museum in Hinckley, Maine where a forgotten American impressionist named Charles D. Hubbard has made the most singular habitat dioramas. They are more like synesthetic three-dimensional paintings with birds in them. And they were made for the purpose of this school that was designed by Hinckley, which was a working farm for orphaned boys, later orphaned girl, orf orphan girls. So um, I spent a great deal of time with, um, with Charles D. Hubbard and those rooms. And that's why I thank Rosamond Purcell, actually, because as some of you know, the great natural historian photographer, she also has found herself in that museum and she's photographed it and her photographs are going to form a large part of this book. So um, uh, yeah, the book really, 
we're back to Lance's introduction. <laughs> there are nuts and bolts and <laughs> uh, it's very capacious, but I hope um, it doesn't exhaust exhaust a reader, nor can it possibly exhaust the subject, but um, rooms really figure centrally. I said, I promised that I would talk about mood rooms, my, the idea I'd like to develop here while I'm in Berlin, and um, I, I realized when I was putting the, the reading together tonight that I, I think I need a separate uh, event for that. <laughs> Really, I mean, I would need to, to do a reading that exemplifies this idea and um, the sorts of questions that compel me. And I, so if anyone uh, wants to invite me to a venue <laughs> to talk about mood rooms, um, really, that is a whole separate subject. But I'm happy to talk about it now as well, but I don't want to overstay my welcome at the podium. <laughs> I could talk about it, but yeah. Your heart says enough. <laughs> <laughs> you were certainly not what we are talking.